we have lots and lots of different things going on here. And all of them are good. And some of them really look different. Um, I went on the Internet three days ago. Uh, a student of mine who became a nun here years ago, um, this last weekend took her full ordination with my Dharma sister. And they couldn't find the 25 Dharma teacher precepts. And so it became, I get this call. And it becomes a big issue because people are really unhappy. They're going to take precepts, but they don't have the Dharma teacher precepts. Because Tianan did this thing where you could become a bhikkhu, or you become a Zen priest, you become a Dharma teacher, and, you know, and, and he had these slightly different things. And I asked one time, uh, Venerable Suhita, who was here last week, I asked him one time when he, a couple years ago when he came back out, I said, well, I know who the Dharma teachers that, that Sudo had were, and I know the few people that actually took the traditional 250 bhikkhu precepts, but I said, who were the Zen priests? And he looked at me and said, you. And I said, oh, because he would always list it out, you could take these, these um, precepts. And Dharma teacher for him was very much like a minister. That's how Sudo envisioned it when he made his changes to adapt to American culture. He saw Zen priest very much like what the Zen centers, the Japanese Zen centers have, um, that these would be householders that would also have part of the monk's life in their everyday life. Yeah, and then of course bhikkhus would be celibate and they would live at the temple and, and live the simple life. That kind of got a little upside down when all the Vietnamese arrived. He never thought any Vietnamese were coming here. So he, he waded in and started using skillful means and the first thing was that the first few ordinations he gave, he was giving those to single people. Then he had a nun who had a child, two children to raise. So even though she wasn't married, uh, can't technically be a bhikkhuni and stay home and raise children. So he gave her dharma, that's Reverend Karuna, gave her dharma teacher precepts. And uh, then it just kind of grew. And then married people started coming and saying, we'd like to take precepts. And so an extraordinary thing, first time in the history of Buddhism that you have married people and unmarried people ordaining. And then trying to figure out exactly what that meant. (laughs) And there's still confusion. It's still a popular topic. What does it mean to be uh, a monk who's married? And I'm glad, Steve, for a while I was trying to make, I was trying to always use the word priest to try to take care of some of the confusion for some of the people that are trained here to get them to think of themselves as a priest and stop thinking themselves as a monk because I realized it was causing them a confusion. To me, monk simply meant lifelong practice. In my mind, that's what it meant. It did not mean celibate on side of a hill in a monastery, isolated. It meant never give up practice. And, um, but anyway, so this thing called American Buddhism, I went out looking for these 25 precepts and got a real surprise. Back when I first got on the internet, I typed in Buddhism, Zen, and got knocked out of my chair with all the hits coming from all the Zen centers that had set up little sites. This time I tried, typed in Zen priest precepts and got all of these things from the different centers, some of them very intimidating about their training process. And, of course, the Japanese have have honed this down to a a highly defined and definite and involved and complicated and kind of system of what are you doing as you're becoming a priest. Pretty interesting stuff. Makes me feel good. I looked at it and I thought, holy mackerel. How many hundreds of hours did people spend on figuring this out? The first three years, you're going to do this much meditation, that you're going to do this, that you're going to go do that, that you got to live here, that you got to do this many training periods, that you got to do this. I mean, it was down in detail. Okay. Well, I was trained by two teachers, one Japanese and one Vietnamese. And the one part that most Americans miss is dealing with non-structure. 
they both had a great deal of structure, and just when you'd get used to it, they would throw you into non-structure. You have five minutes and you have to give the talk. Okay? But we have this way of doing things. I know. But you have to do this in five minutes. We have this way of doing things. I know. But we're going to do it different this time. Because we can very easily get used to what we think is supposed to free us from attachment. It's very easy to do that. The robe and the bowl is supposed to free us from attachment. So now we become attached to the robe and the bowl. Everything is here. Everything is different. Americans right now are trying to figure out who they are. And some incredibly good work has been done. These training programs are very important for people who need that kind of structure that can only function if they're told, you got to do this for four weeks, you got to do this for eight weeks, you got to do this for 20 weeks. Then you're done, and then you can do this. I studied with the Japanese and I studied with the Vietnamese. And if there was one thing they both consistently did at the least expected time is to take away any props. And they both taught the same thing. A Zen talk is always extemporaneous. Masters do not use notes. And they forced us to talk, give really bad talks, <laughs> you know, about stuff we knew nothing about to try to teach us to relax and take a deep breath and just do the best we could, which is exactly what we learn on the cushion, to relax and take a deep breath and do the best we can.